I checked into a hotel in Dublin before heading off to do a sound check with the blizzards at the Academy in Middle Abbey Street, where they were launching their new album later that evening. The reason I was involved in the sound check was simple. Last year, the blizzards asked me if they could record my voice as background for one of their songs. I agreed. And then when the time came to launch the album, they invited me to be on stage with them. I used to sing along with Trust Me, I'm a Doctor in the Pajero years ago when I was driving the daughter to school, just to keep calm if the traffic in Mullingar was snarled up. I never thought I'd end up on stage with them, especially not since I qualified for a bus pass. In the hotel foyer, two American couples were discussing airline flights, boarding passes and COVID-19. I produced a face mask, attached it to my ears and stood at reception. A woman behind the desk requested identification. I produced a passport, which I had with me because I travelled from Donegal by plane that morning. It may surprise some people that I took a passport to Dublin, even though I was only coming from Donegal. But that's the price we pay for airport security, I suppose. It's the return journey from Dublin to Donegal that causes me bother, because there's only one security queue, whether you're going either to Boston or Bundorn. Anyway, I produced the document for the receptionist, and she scrutinised it. The photograph was taken last year when the passport came up for renewal. I was recovering from serious illness at the time, and I have to admit that I've seen better-looking corpses. So whether or not the receptionist managed to identify the slightest resemblance between me and the photograph, I can't say. But eventually she handed me the key to a room. I had no bottled water in my luggage, and that bothered me. Three years ago, I had a heart attack in a hotel, and I'm no longer comfortable with the central heating in some establishments. I worry I might dehydrate in the night, so I always bring a bottle of sparkling water with me. At home in the hills above Loch Allen, I sleep with the window open. And even on summer nights, the breeze from the lake and the rustle of trees cools me down. Dublin hotels are a different kettle of fish. I close the windows because young people on the street below are usually enjoying life at such a level of intensity and sexual frenzy that they keep me awake. The squeals of a young person at full tilt on a stag or hen night in Temple Bar would keep a David Attenborough awake. But if I close the windows, the central heating sucks moisture from the air and the lungs in my ribcage feel like two very large and dried prunes. And if I turn up the fan to get more air, I feel like I'm lying under the wing of an aircraft with the engine running. I flap like a whale and don't sleep so... I go out walking at the crack of dawn, negotiating my way around streets stained with cigarette butts, empty beer bottles and vomit, where young men are stretched in sleeping bags like dead seals on the pavement. So despite the sound check at 4pm, I went out to find me sparkling water, and when I returned with a two-litre bottle under me oxter, the receptionist eyed me with what I thought was unwarranted curiosity. To be fair, the room was splendid, and the bed was as extensive as a little bouncy castle. So like Goldilocks, I lay down for a moment and fell instantly asleep, until a text from the venue landed at 5 p.m., where the fuck are you? I leaped from the bed in a panic, got out the door, ran down the wrong stairs and ended up in a kitchen. 
Then I burst through the foyer, where a cluster of English men were waiting on a taxi, and I almost knocked one of them over as I scurried through. They might even have heard me mutter the fabled words, Excuse me, I'm a doctor. But they were not to know that I had an appointment with destiny, and no traffic could bar my way. I was gigging with the blizzards. Well, I thought myself very cool, you know. Like at my age, to be on stage with the blizzards, and it was a it was a little club on Abbey Street, the Academy, and sure enough, we did the sound check, and that night, there was a packed audience of young people. A bar was open. They were all squashed up towards the stage. The blizzards played for about 40 minutes, and then my big moment came where I joined them in stage and spoke the words I'm supposed to speak at the right time. It was actually something from, I think it was from a column, but I'm reading it this morning because, well, at that time of year, I always find the end of November is a lovely dead time. So there's no kind of climax. The big climax was Samhain. The big climax was thinking about your loved ones and Remembrance Day and all the people who've gone to their rest. And then you think about the souls and you think about religious things and you get a kind of good buzz out of feeling that even if you're on a, on your own, that in some way you're, you're still part of a community, that the people that you loved still love you. You still hold them in your heart. And that gives you a good buzz. And then you go into this quiet time where it's like you're holding your breath before Christmas. Now, there's two ways to do that. One is to kind of be adrift like a little boat on the sea and you've no control, you've no rudder, and you're just kind of dreading the rocks that you're drifting towards. And you drift towards Christmas like you're drifting towards these rocks. And the other way is to put a little bit of shape into the winter and to, to be like the boat that has a rudder. And for me, the way to do that is when you finish with the remembrance, that time of Samhain, which is just over, you kind of have this period, which it's like an interim, it's like a bardo experience, it's like a, you hold your breath and wait for Christmas. And to shape it, to have a rudder in it, is for me to go back, one, to enjoy in the darkness, and secondly, to enjoy the darkness by telling stories. In other words, now is the time for the storytelling. There was a, a word that had in the in the traveller language of Scotland, Whidden Toy. Whidden Toy were, were the, the talking nights, they used to call them. So at this time of year, travellers would focus simply on kind of digging into the dark in a positive way. And the great shovel, if you like, for digging into the dark is the story. So every time I meet somebody now, in the second half of November, I'm always in a restaurant or in a cafe or in the barber shop, wherever. I'm always ready for the story. I was with the barber yesterday. He was a Palestinian and he did a great job on my hair and my beard and he was telling me all sorts of stories about his life and his father, who is a general, if you don't mind, in the Palestinian army and the, he works in the Lebanon because there are 12 big refugee camps in the Lebanon where a huge population of Palestinians are still in exile after 70 years and living in very difficult circumstances and they don't have the kind of human rights that come when you have citizenship of a country and they're, they're displaced people and, and it's a very, very unjust and terrible system that they have to endure. Anyway, his father is a general running one of those camps and he's a barber in Ireland and he cut my hair yesterday. And talking to somebody like that or talking to somebody in a restaurant that you meet accidentally, that to me becomes the central thing that you do for the next three or four weeks. And I cook my dinner usually before six o'clock in the evening. 
I don't let it go too late and I don't have it too early. And I kind of sit down and enjoy the dinner and then when it's over, maybe about seven o'clock, I'm ready for sometimes watching the television, enjoying Netflix. I, I kind of have to say I love watching television in the winter because it is a form of storytelling. I feel that there's a storyteller in front of me if I find a good story. And Netflix is one place, but M-U-B-I, Mubi, that's another one. I, I, they they do kind of really serious art movies. Last night the, they were showing a, a film called The Tree of the Wooden Clogs. And it won the Palm d'Or, the Golden Award in the Cannes Film Festival in, I think, 1978. And I saw that film, I would think, about 1979, in Maynooth College, the, the film club on the campus, ran that film, and I saw it in the Aula Maxima in Maynooth. And I remember walking back afterwards, it might have been 10 o'clock at night after the film was over, and I was walking back across the medieval square in Maynooth towards Logic House, where my bedroom was, and... Um, I was astonished by the beauty of that film. And it was one of those moments in life that you remember forever. You know, you rem you actually remember walking out the door of the Isle of Maxima. So many other times I was in that big building and I don't remember it. But on that occasion, because of that film, it was like the imprint it leaves on my psyche, on my consciousness, is extraordinary. And it's amazing how... Like some events leave an imprint on you that remains with you forever. And then other things happen. And it's like it, it's it's like the imprint wasn't as heavy in the in the ground. There's there's mark there's a mark there, but it's not as deep. And and you can't figure out why would that film walking out of the Aula Maxima at 10 o'clock at night in the darkness of a winter night, why would that matter so much that I would remember it for years? And, you know, if you string together the moments that left deep imprints, then you get the shape of your identity, who you are. It's like... It's like a necklace of moments that really mattered to you. But the mysterious thing is that you don't get to choose which those moments are. Sometimes there could be very traumatic days, very traumatic moments where something terrible or violent happens and you don't necessarily remember it. Sometimes there are things which are trivial, tiny, and you remember them forever. I remember, I remember like little moments when I was fishing as a child. And I can remember the bait, the, the, you know, it was a spinning sort of, what did you call it, a reel. And the little bait was called a voblex. And there was a Voblex 6 and a Voblex 8. And I remembered them. I, like if I had it in my hand now. It's as clear as that. And yet there's other huge things that happen and I don't remember. And I don't get to choose what those moments are. And yet, and yet they shape who I am when I'm talking to you. So it seems to me that I can never get away from the sense I have that my, my true self is actually only the surface of the wave. You know, what I, what I think is this identity, what I think is this self, this me, is actually only the crest of a wave. It's like there's something coming through me all the time. There's some, there's some life force which is not me and yet is within me. And when I say me, I end up thinking, well, well, that's just the ego, that's just the surface of me. And then gradually I begin to experience a sense of awakenedness at the deeper level. 
I begin to identify more and more with, with the deeper self. The thing or the life force that flows through me, I begin to identify with it. And more and more I can let go of the ego. You know, I'm 21 years of age and somebody says, you didn't park that car correctly. And I say, how dare you say that to me? Because the absolute me, the absolute I, is very strong when you're young. And then as you get older and you get kind of battered and scarred by life and by relationships where you make mistakes and you fail other people, and then by health issues when, you're, when your health starts to get wobbly, you begin to let go a little bit of the surface level of the ego and you begin to live more and more deep down in the kind of sense of, that which is alive within you, flowing through you. And you can let go of the ego a little bit more. That's if, if things are going good. And all that comes from talking about the three of the wooden clogs. And the three of the wooden clogs comes from talking about what's available on the television. And what's available on the television comes from the fact that I wanted to share with you how beautiful it is at this time of year to tell stories, to natter away to people, to engage with people. You know, they used to do it in the old days. This was the time when, as I say, Whitten Toy, the talking nights would happen, or in the settled community, in rural areas, people would have a shanaki, and this would be a busy time. Get the old shanaki to come in there and tell us a few stories, and in he'd come and shorten the night, and maybe too it was a time for having a little bottle of whiskey or a little bit of putching in the house. You know, there's a way to drink whiskey. And it's slowly. Very, very slowly. If you if you drink, you know when we drink whiskey and you get a short and you think that's not very much and you knock it back. Well, this is okay once in a while. You know, if if you've just sort of done some heroic deed or if it's minus 30 outside and you want to warm yourself up but if you want to drink whiskey the way to drink it is drop by drop and then you get the taste of it you know you get a good whiskey single malt it has to be or pot still or whatever variations but a good quality of whiskey there's Scotch whiskies that there are the really, really beautiful whiskies. And more recently there's Irish stuff you get. Drum Shambo has a whiskey. And there's a crowd here near me, Crawley, a beautiful single malt whiskey. So you you get your whiskey and you you drink it drop by drop. You put very little in, have a measure and make the measure half of a half. I know that sounds crazy. A half of a half. And pour it into your nice little glass. And sip it like one drop on your tongue at a time. And allow it to to electrify the tongue with taste. And then you begin to taste whiskey. And gradually, over the night, you're, you're drinking that little bit of whiskey. Drop by drop, it's affecting the kind of sensations in your tongue and in your mouth and then it's it's actually going into your bloodstream not through your stomach but but actually through your mouth and that's the way to do it and you'll find this glow comes after about we'll say we'll say three of them now remember on my measures that's only one and a half shorts but three of them should get you through the night and you'd have a glow. And that's the way I drink whiskey. And I only do that in the winter. There's, it doesn't make sense in summertime to be drinking whiskey. But it does at this time of year. And there's nothing as lovely as a little, little drop of whiskey on your tongue when you're listening to a good story. And there's the two ways that I would spend November, this time of year, the second half of November. I'm not thinking of anything meaningful. 
I'm not thinking of philosophical things. I'm bracing myself for Christmas because Christmas is going to be like first of Advent. The start of Advent is going to be for me like ah, joy and prayer and all the rest of it. So, as I was saying last week in relation to faith, sometimes you need to go from faith to non-belief. You need to kind of let it flow through you. Let it be like a tide a tidal wave that comes in, the tide of faith comes in and you you feel full of your belief and then it goes out again and you let it go out and you enjoy the emptiness of it and, and you enjoy reading Dawkins and listening to Dr. Brian Cox and all sorts of people and you re- re- rejoice in the fact and the insights and the realisations of that existential empty universe just as you would if you were walking on the beach and the tide has gone out and there's a big long beach. Well, you wouldn't go home and say, oh, I'm not walking today because the tide has gone out. No, it's, it's lovely when the tide is out. It's so empty. And then that moment in your life happens and you're full with this kind of sense of emptiness, which is an odd way to say it, but it's true. You can be full with the sense of emptiness rather than feeling kind of awful because you're empty. Tell yourself, it's okay to be empty. I don't feel any sense of enthusiasm for any lyrical, romantic, metaphorical way of talking about the universe like there was gods or something. No, there isn't. There's nothing. It's meaningless. And then enjoy that. Enjoy that. Say, okay, it's meaningless. But look look at me. I'm breathing. So there's a, there's a real lucky accident of a meaningless universe, isn't it? This whole 13 billion years, meaningless evolving in meaningless ways and it throws you up well aren't you lucky <laughs> am and I lucky you just enjoy the emptiness enjoy the darkness how do you enjoy the darkness the tiniest drop of whiskey and a good story now that would be my way to do it and I wouldn't recommend whiskey to anybody All I'm saying is if you do take a little whiskey, take it very slowly and enjoy it drip by drip. That's the secret of being able to taste the whiskey. It's the secret of enjoying the winter on a cold winter's night. It does help me sleep. And I feel lonely sometimes because... We don't have storytellers in the same way. We have live theatre. That's okay, but then you have to go out to the theatre. Nothing happens in the house. I suppose except for Netflix. And Mubi. And some of the other channels that give you movies and good stories. And I take them all as storytelling. And I don't feel guilty about it. I put me feet up after me dinner and maybe drop a little tincture of whiskey in the glass. And that's it for the day. So that's the way I kind of enjoy this time of year. And for that reason, I felt I must tell some stories now. I must do a podcast and just put in three or four stories I started with that one. They're kind of, for me, you see, the the story is like a memory, and a memory is a story. I said to people, have you any stories? They'd say, no. If I said, do you have any memories that are interesting about your life? They'd say, no. But if I was sitting in a particular particular pub with somebody who lived in the same town all, all his life, and I said to him, was this pub always owned by the Maguires? That'd be a trigger. And off he'd go telling me, oh, well, this pub used to be owned by the Rileys. And at that time, it was called the Slither Rileys. And the reason we called it the Slither Rileys was because people used to slither in and slither out and after hours. And on the storytelling goes, when you trigger it, and you trigger it with a question, and it's usually very easy to get stories going if you talk about memories, if you talk about the past. 
when you were growing up, was Letterkenny as busy as it is now? Well, all I would have to do is drop that like a bomb in some conversation and all I could sit back then and listen for half an hour. And I think it's lovely when you have accidental storytelling happens in the supermarkets. And on the door of the supermarket, you know when you're coming out and, and there's space there and you're just going out and somebody nods at you and you say, hello, how are you doing? I haven't seen you for a while. And then you have a conversation. And all the conversations you have in the wintertime are fierce rich. At this time of year. And you haven't yet started talking about Christmas. You're talking about things that happened probably in the summer. You talk about people's health. How's Mary doing? I heard she wasn't well. And then that brings a story. And the stories, the stories are also a kind of way that they kind of knit everybody together. I, I'm fierce against, you know that word gossip? I really think that that was used unfairly because most of the gossip that ever goes on is actually storytelling. It's actually sharing stories about the fabric of community that builds the community stronger. Anyway, I, I have memories like, you know, all through the summer I had memories of last year and now I just look back on the whole year. I mean, I was in Beaumont at one stage, 2021, recovering from the operation and I lay in bed with 30 staples along my spine and I was so proud of them that I took a photograph with the aid of a mirror in the hospital bathroom. If the illness arose as a subject of conversation in the future, I'd have an image with which to impress my listeners. The custom of brandishing sores or scars at a dinner table was widespread in the cavern of my childhood. I often saw men opening their shorts to display the white line of the knife along their ribcage after open-heart surgery, as if they were displaying All-Ireland medals. My little staples were not so dramatic. They looked more like a zip, or sleepers for a train, a tiny train up me back. But at least I had a few colourful details about the operation to spice up any narrative. For example, someone attached cod liver oil capsules to my spine with a strip of adhesive tape before the operation. They x-rayed me with the capsules in place so that the doctors would have a precise map of my spine to work with when they cut the flesh. When I emerged from hospital, I wasn't in a mood for visitors. I moped around the garden, lingered in the bedroom, or lay on the sofa as a stream of Netflix movies assaulted my tranquillity. And when I tried to get up from the sofa, it was almost impossible. That's when I remembered the walking stick. The walking stick was in my office for years. The shaft was made from blackthorn, and the handle was crafted from the jawbone of a goat. It was a gift, and I used it once in a theatre show, in which I played an old man recounting a tragic tale. The stick gave me a kind of authenticity on stage that the drama required. But I never used it in real life. It was a theatrical prop, and it ended up hanging on the wall just beside the bookcase, where I keep my religious icons. And sometimes it too acquired the air of a sacred object. Walking sticks demanded my attention as a child. My granny had one, and a blind man who lived next door to her on Bridge Street had another one. 
he would sit in the sun with a handkerchief on his bald head, and his knuckles wound around the top of his stick. In fact, I can't remember any old people who didn't have sticks in those days. It's amazing how hip replacements can transform the world. As a child, I was brought to knock on several occasions, and sometimes to holy wells. Meandering through the crowds, I could not avoid the panoply of crude walking aids and crutches hanging from ledges or fastened to various walls, free floating canes and crutches proclaiming that some miracle had happened there. Some wondrous cure had been obtained at the gable of that particular church or this particular well. I imagined the afflicted pilgrims being healed so dramatically that they just flung the crutches away from them. But I would have been terrified to touch a crutch or prosthetic limb I had a vague notion that the disease of the pilgrim might remain in the crutch after the pilgrim had been cured. The stick or walking aid embodied pain, and if I dared to touch it, some mysterious disease might flow down the shaft into my body. Such was my limited grasp of science. But that's the way fear and awe operate. I had no language to contain the reality of suffering, so I could only construct meaning from symbols. Illness was about touch and sensation and objects that carried fearful magic, like the wands of wizards or the crooks of the white-haired bishop or the stick of the blind man who used it to beat out the time when he lilted a jig. When I got through the operation in 2021, people said I was lucky. But that's not how I saw it. There was nothing lucky about the doctors and nurses in Beaumont. Their healing power was transmitted to me through touch and sensation. And afterwards, the walking stick became a symbol of that grace. I felt not lucky, but grateful. After a while, I could rise from the sofa like a lark from its boggy nest, and the stick returned to the wall beside the bookcase of holy objects, because it too was a symbol, a wand of invisible healing, an icon of the wound the light came in. Yeah, I, I used to go to, well, I went once with my granny to knock. I probably was six, seven years of age. And again, it's one of those moments that made such a deep imprint on my mind that it remains to this day. I'm sitting in the back of an Austin A7. My granny is in the back seat with me, and she's a big lady, as far as I'm concerned. And we're going over a humped back bridge somewhere in Roscommon, and she's not ready for it, and her whole body rises and hits the roof of the car, flattening her hat. It's very, very funny and very, very frightening. And she was very confused, and my father had to slow down the car and nearly stop to make sure that she wasn't too distressed. And that's my memory of Knock. I don't remember what Knock was like on that particular day, but I do remember Granny and her rosary beads and her hat hitting the roof. And those rosary beads were the rosary beads that were in her hand when she was praying the rosary in her bed, 
crying and saying everything's gone dark everything's gone dark i can't see anything and she was lying there in the bed and my mother was on her knees crying and saying mammy mammy you'd be all right and i was at the door this was in bridge street my granny's house and again i was maybe um oh i was about seven or eight years of age at this stage now and i remember that and that had a deep imprint that remained always in my life that moment with granny and the beads the sound of the beads they were old-fashioned beads and the sound of them rattling in her hand and her at 80 years or 81 years of age crying that she couldn't see and she didn't understand why her sight had suddenly gone we know so much now we're so lucky to have medicine that protects our eyes i'm talking to you as somebody who had a detached retina only nine months ago and now it's it's cured and perfectly fine because of the great doctors in the galba clinic but in those days in 1960 my granny wasn't going to get that kind of service we couldn't imagine in those days nobody could imagine in those days the technological improvements that would improve people's health times when everybody everybody over a certain age was going around with a stick if you were old you were wearing black you were sitting in a chair in the sun and you were hobbling up and down the street with a stick that's what an old person looked like the concept of somebody in their 70s having a full life waltzing around at a dinner party or maybe running a marathon as many people do in their, in their 70s wasn't something that we dreamed of back in those days which is 80 years ago now 60 years ago 60 years ago but those rosary beads they appeared again because there were certain things that the daughters and sons of my granny divided out between them and my mother happened to take the rosary beads. Now it's not that my mother was a... She wasn't like a person for saying the rosary all the time but looking back on it she was more religious than I realised. She did have the prayer book always and she had it stuffed with all sorts of you know the little death card memorial cards and she'd be reading that in the corner sometimes even when we were young and we'd be watching the telly and she'd be there in the corner and you'd look over to see are you watching this mammy and you'd realize she was reading out of this old prayer book and it was actually a prayer book that had been her granny's like the the folding over those a, a beautiful leather cover on it and then there was this kind of plastic weaving around the edge that give the trim that give the edge of the old prayer book a lovely trim and the rosary beads the sound of the rosary beads would be what i could hear even even though the television was on sometimes she'd be moving the rosary beads and she'd leave them on the shelf beside her and you'd hear the kind of hard metal of the crucifix hitting the wood of the shelf and i'd look over and i'd realize she'd been fingering the beads so maybe she was more religious than i realized but there's no doubt that those rosary beads lasted and they lasted until she passed away and she was 96 when she died and needless to say those rosary beads came to me and as I'm talking to you, those rosary beads are behind me on the shelf where I keep the icons. There's some continuum there. There's some energy and power that those beads have that were once sitting in my granny's purse when my granny was in the car and her hat was hitting the roof of the little Austin A7 on our way to Knock. And the way that those rosary beads have travelled from one place to another. They've travelled from 
her hands to my mother's hands and from my mother's hands to me, to myself and sometimes to my hands. I just touch them. And the walking stick has the same effect and the walking stick is to me left here. The walking stick is to me left, still hanging on the wall, lovely white bone of a goat used for the handle of it. Beautiful, straight walking stick. And that, for me, as I say, I used it once or twice in a, a one-man show where I was playing the, the broken old man. But it was a stage prop until that time, coming out of hospital, coming out of Beaumont, after an operation, not being able to walk properly, not being able to get up off the sofa and using the stick. And there it was. And it became this sort of crutch that helped me. It became functional after all those years. And then the beautiful, beautiful miracle that I thank God for of being healed, of recovering. Not in any magical process, but in the way that the surgeon and the doctors and the nurses and everybody in Beaumont Hospital worked, put in hours to my life to improve it, to save me from catastrophe. And I feel endlessly grateful. And then after a while that stick became useless in the sense that it had no more practical function. But for me it's still a symbol of the power of healing. And it's like the crutch that you might see at the Holy Well or at Knock. I leave it on the wall. I'll always have it on the wall, close to the icons, as almost like the icon of my gratefulness, the symbol of my song of thanks for health. Well, I, I'd love to maybe just talk one one more little story you know about the candle because it's a lovely time of year to think about candles as well and being ill being ill is like forgetting who you were you get lost in a forest of unease and it's difficult to remember life before the catastrophe Fortunately, I seem to be emerging from the forest. For three months, I could only see fog in my left eye. But thanks to a surgical procedure, I can gaze at flowers once again with both eyes, which in itself is another little miracle. I feel so good. I'm even trying to reinvent myself. One week during the summer, I did a gig with amazing artists, young artists in Dublin. The singer, her name is A.E. Mack, spelt M-A-K, A.E. Mack. She was on the bill and just before my spot she gave a stunning rendition of the Chelsea Hotel. I had prepared a monologue about a rural bachelor. But by the time A. E. Mack had dazzled the audience, I realised my whinging recitation would be out of place. So at the last minute, I decided to sing The Rocks of Bourne instead. A ballad suitable enough for Methuselah. It is the dirge of a clearly depressed male singing about another depressed male. But people love it. So I gripped the microphone fearlessly and gave it socks. Oh, come all ye here all and listen unto me. <clears throat> when I got the bus pass a few years ago, I still paid bus fares because I didn't want anyone to think I was old. I considered myself youthful until a pregnant woman stood up in a tram one day and offered me her seat. 
but I don't hide my seniority any longer. Nowadays I wear a paddy cap and flaunt it. I wasn't even embarrassed last week when a neighbour drove me to Galway for a check-up with the ophthalmic surgeon, the eye doctor as we used to call him, although my neighbour drove erratically, alternating her foot between the accelerator and the brake every fifteen minutes. It was a hybrid Toyota, and she was trying to stay in electric mode to save petrol. I was worried I might need neck surgery by the time we reached Galway. Do you not realise I have a detached retina, says I? If you continue taking your foot on and off the pedal, my eye is liable to fly out and hit the windscreen. In the clinic, I sat in a waiting area watching the war in Ukraine on television. The old people around me discussed the dreadful weather while the young ones remained aloof, their fingers glued to dainty keyboards on mobile phones. It's the cuckoo's fault, an old man declared. I beg your pardon? The storm, he explained. There's always a spell of rough weather this time of year. My mother used to say it was nature taking revenge on the cuckoo. I thanked him for the information and secretly regretted I hadn't brought me earphones. But at least the prognosis from the doctor was good. The retina was healing. So I suggested to me driver that we go shopping in the city to celebrate. She agreed. And while she headed off to the big stores, I slipped down the side streets in search of vintage clothes. I was fingering my way through tweed jackets to see if I could find a large scythe when a man stumbled into the shop as if he had been wrestling with some addictive demon. He headed for the crockery and second-hand books. His bony fingers slithered along a shelf, and I feared he might knock everything down. The shop attendant noted his confusion and got up close behind him. His ivory fingers reached out and clutched a candle, as if it were an anchor in a storm, and he was an unmoored boat. What's this? he wondered, not recognising the object. It's a candle, the shop assistant said from behind. He couldn't comprehend where he was, never mind what was on the shelf. He may even have been uncertain as to where the other voice was coming from. A candle, he whispered, still holding it as if it were liable to jump into the air. A smelly candle, the woman said. Lightening the moment. Ah, right, he exclaimed, because now he understood. And he held it as if he were remembering some long ago country where he was happy or innocent or at peace. That's right, he mumbled, smiling, a smelly candle. It struck me that there must have been a time when he was safe and secure, a single day when a fragrant candle flickered before him in some room that he had long ago forgotten. But I looked away because I didn't want to appear as if I was staring. It's a heartbreak when you meet somebody, somebody who's suffering addiction or homelessness or, you know, so many demons that are tormenting them that they kind of have lost touch with the ordinary reality of what's around them. And then they too, just like me, they too have things imprinted, imprinted in them. 
and if you find one of them it can change them, bring them back to life. And the candle that he didn't recognize, and she said, oh, a smelly candle. He just remembered some moment, whatever it was, I don't know. Maybe he was married one time. Maybe he was, you know, a happy husband with no addictions and a family. Who knows? Why he remembered, why it mattered to him, why it was like a light shining for him in the darkness. In a second hand, a vintage shop looking at a candle. It's how fragile we are as creatures. And how these imprints, these moments, make a huge and deep imprint in our life that shapes us, that we remember through the years and the decades. The things that we remember and never forget because they matter to us, because they make us who we are, because because almost telling them and remembering them is a way of becoming who we are. I become more present in the present moment as I share the story with you. And what, what amazes me is that you don't get to choose what those things are. You don't get to choose what makes the big impression in you. So if I put all the memories of my life together that matter to me, that that by sharing them in memoirs, I become who I am. I become more present in this moment because I tell you, look, this is who I am. That sharing of stories that young lovers do Young lovers do very often the first time they're physically intimate and maybe they're sleeping together and they wake up the next morning. And what do they do when their heads are on the pillows? What do they do? They tell stories. They ask each other questions like, because the intimacy and the intensity of sex is over and then they're, they're there in the kind of afterglow of their sexual encounter and their intensity. And then all that libido has gone quiet and there's another space rises in them and they ask questions and they say things like where's your mother from or do you play football or were you on the team last year and the answer is always given as a story we share who we are by telling the stories and the stories are made up of those deep moments those moments that make deep impressions on us the candle and that that man in his desolate suffering and yet that candle he gripped it like I remember some moment that was important to me and me with my granny and me with my granny's rosary beads all these moments make us who we are and here's the strange thing we don't get to choose what the moments are we don't pick the moments that we remember 20 years later it just happens to be that I remember, let's say, seeing that movie, The Tree of the Wooden Clogs. I remember walking out the door of the Aula Maxima. I remember the, the frosty night. Why that, why that memory makes the deep impression, I don't know. We don't get to choose. And yet those memories are what make us present and real in the present moment and that is that is the best way I have to talk about how we are simply a wave our consciousness is moving like a wave it is a surface that expresses itself in story and memory but beneath it our deepest unfathomable presence our participation in the mysterious being of all things that we are aware of. It comes from somewhere else. And through those moments we're shaped. And in the remembrance of them and the telling stories from memory, we become more present 
that big unfathomable mystery inside us. Now, that's as far as I'll go with the old heavy stuff today because I wanted to share stories. I wanted to share the second half of November with you like a time of storytelling. And I have one more. I have one more if you don't mind. I'll be running over time. But here's just one last. About my beloved Bundor. I love Bundor. Especially walking around the cliffs as far as Tullin Strand where the surfers embrace the waves. I can never forget the donkey ride I had on the beach with my mother by my side when I was six years old. She too had enjoyed the donkey rides when she was young. Of course it wasn't the same donkey, it was Bundoran's enduring magic that she wanted to share. Her own mother used to take a house every summer for two weeks. One week with her daughters and one week with her sons. They came on the train from Cavan, by way of Clonus and Enniskillen, and bathed in, a, in the sea or in the Trepany Pool, and ate ice cream and boiled sweets and took rides on donkeys. I often wonder just how many people have come to promenade along the pathways of Bundorn over the decades since the trains arrived in the 19th century and the town established itself as a holiday resort. People from across Ulster discussing various coronations, wars, famines and peace agreements that shaped Europe, staring at the same rocks and sandy beaches and listening to the same guns cry. What changed from one generation to the next was Europe. What remained the same was the far-flung sunlight across the bay the flap of the ocean on Tullin Strand and the clack of golf balls along the elegant lawns around the Great Northern Hotel. The golfing lawns stretched to the rim of the cliff and on the adjacent pathway there are benches where tired folk can sit and reflect. Even I have found refuge on those benches occasionally when I was depressed or defeated by small things. In my teens I lost a girlfriend and I cried my eyes out like boys were not supposed to do. And on the day of my leaving certificate results arrived, I realised I would never be a nuclear physicist or a professor of literature. It's not just my own youthful ghost that I find haunting the cliffs. I imagine women in Victorian dresses and maids pushing prams and nuns enfolded in yards of black serge with white starch veils, all enjoying the same sunlight falling on the same white waves. I imagine the occasional maid taking a rest on one of those benches to dream up her future or just to rock the pram. I imagine a cluster of nuns idling away the morning, wondering about the next life as they finger their beads. There is even a nun's pool at the far end of town, a secluded swimming area where the sisters may have once policed their orphans in that long ago unhappy Ireland. There are few enough nuns or domestic maids promenading anywhere nowadays. But the human heart remains the same. Today the coffee shops and the beaches are full of surfers from across the globe who come to enjoy the same waves and talk about the same things. One day recently 
I was sitting on a bench close to the golf links, when suddenly a stranger sat down beside me. A big, rugged man with an unruly beard and a grey ponytail. You look worse in real life than on television he declared as he sat down and you look like you had a late night i countered we were dancing he said he pointed down the pathway and i saw a little woman some distance off carrying two chalk ices towards her i told him to say hello to you she said when she arrived we took the train to Sligo because the car was shook, and then we got the bus, she said. Beyond where we sat, golfers were teeing up their balls and clattering them into the distance. The husband is like yourself, she added. He's a bit fragile. He had emergency surgery on the heart last year. I'm always telling him he should take up golf. I'd prefer Javen, he muttered. We come to Bundorn for the country music weekends. So we were at Jimmy Buckley last night, she added, licking the end of her chalk eyes and smiling. And when they were gone, my own mother returned. I imagined her as a little girl running towards the wave untroubled by the prospect of adulthood, the mysteries of childbirth, or the grief of widowhood. That was all before her in the summer of 1922, when she was six years old on the back of a donkey, as carefree and happy as any child in the town of Bundorn. Dear friends, thank you for listening and thank you for being here. I'll talk to you again next weekend. Enjoy the time of the stories this last two weeks in November. And if you are taking a little whiskey at night, take it drop by drop. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.